Voltages. Voltage regulation. How do we make a voltage that is stable? That's what I want to look at today. I want to justify a bit why we need voltage regulation. And then I'll, I'm going to introduce the two different types. So you have the linear regulators and you have the switched regulators. But why is important? It's, it's important to understand the why. Most of the stuff that we have around us um, when it comes to electronics is powered by batteries. So anything that you wear, like the wristband I have on my hand, or your computer, or pretty much anything, runs on a battery. And it's actually the battery chemistry that determines what the voltage is on the terminals. So whether it's a uh, lithium manganese oxide battery or it's a different type of chemistry, that sets what the voltage is. And that's basically diff given by the difference in Fermi level on the two electrodes. So for primary cells, which are sort of the non-rechargeable types, you'll have voltages from 0 0.8 volts for sort of the really small sink air batteries up to 3.6 volts for typical sort of coin cell batteries. For secondary cells, which can be charged, you'll find voltages from 2.5 to 4.3. And then you have the stuff that is powered by USB, and where you might have from, well, maybe around 5 volts, but it depends a bit. There is a very good book called The Lin Linden's Handbook of Batteries, which actually goes through all the battery chemistries it shows you the discharge curves for the different type of chemistries and and what type of energy you can expect to pull out and how much um, what's the energy density and the number of I guess watt hours per kilo or watt hours per volume. So if you're interested interested in batteries and how they are charged and so on, I would recommend that book. So. Somewhere we have the energy source, a battery. And then we have our circuit. So why can't we just power the circuit directly from the battery? Well, here we get into the problem of transistors. Over the past, I guess, almost 70 years, we've been incredibly good at making the transistors smaller and smaller. And now we're at the stage where the oxide between the gate material and the, what we call the channel, where we create the um, inversion charge, that oxide is only a few nanometers, depending a bit on technology. But a few nanometers thick silicon oxide actually has a breakdown voltage of about five megavolts per centimeter. So if the field between the gate and the source is too high, then it breaks down. It stops functioning. There are other challenging effects in a very small transistor like this, and that is also the, the fields that we see in the depletion region close to the drain. So assuming this is NANMOS, assuming we have our source at ground, we have our drain at maybe VDD voltage, turns out that the electrons that get accelerated in the depletion region, some of them can reach so high energies that they actually impact the crystal lattice and knock out covalent bonds, so create electron hole pairs. And they will see an electric field both in the lateral direc direction and the transverse direction. And there's a certain probability that these electrons and holes, for that matter, can enter the oxide and sort of damage the covalent bonds that we have in the oxide. Now, if that happens, we get what's called uh, traps generated. There are, well, it's basically the covalent bonds in the amorphous silicon oxide that break. And since the covalent bonds break, then the, the atoms sort of rearrange a bit. And it doesn't have to go back to where it was. So they can, the, the um, covalent bonds can stay permanently broken. Now that creates 
a possible state for an electron to enter into or a charge to enter into and if an electron sort of gets stuck there jumps into that state from the channeler or from somewhere else we can actually end up creating a negative charge a net negative charge in the oxide now if you remember your transistors you know that you have to apply a positive voltage to the gate or between the gate and the source to be specific in order for there to be an inversion charge so we pull sort of a voltage on the gate and that lowers let's see lowers is lowers correct yeah it bends the conduction band close to the surface such that the electrons in uh, have a, a higher probability of entering into the conduction band uh, close to the surface now if we have charges sort of net negative charge in the oxide it turns out that we have to pull harder <laughs> in order to turn on the transistor all these effects both the time dependent dielectric breakdown which is the breakdown of the oxide itself or the hot carry injection or indeed also the uh, negative bias temperature instability where you're breaking covalent bonds in the oxide directly simply because of the field across it all those type of effects damage our transistors and what we've had to do in order to not make them die too soon actually give them a lifetime of five to ten years or however long the electronics is, is supposed to last is to reduce the supply voltage and actually most foundries will give us a specific voltage that we have to stay within if you don't do that then you'll get a damaged transistor sometimes that is actually useful there is actually a technology that is used in the skywater library or technology that's called a re-ram resistive ram resistive ram yeah re-ram yeah where you have a very thin oxide which naturally has a very high resistive so this is a resistance so this is sort of uh, hundreds of mega ohm and then we apply a field across that resist uh, thin oxide to actually break it down which gives us sort of this low resistive state turns out that this um, conductive channel over across this oxide that can actually be turned on and off while when we apply a field across it and in a reram you can actually change the state go from a high resistive state to a low resistive state and you can do that multiple times and that actually gives you a non-volatile memory so here we're actually using the fact that it's possible to damage <laughs> the sort of thin oxide and it's actually actually also possible to partly repair the oxide in order to store bits non-volatile manner now but for transistors it would be really bad if we have sort of a conductance of 100 microsiemens so what's that uh 10 kilo ohm between our gate and our channel that basically means that transistor doesn't work so from the foundry from Skywater from TSMC from global foundries we will get a specification for a voltage on our transistors now we have different types of transistors quite often we have what's called core voltage transistors typical digital transistors and in 180 nanometer the voltage used to be about 1.8 volts in Skywater 130 the voltage is actually 1.8 volts but for others it might be down to 1.5 and as we scale down technologies down to 22 nanometer the voltage reduces and that's simply because the thickness of the oxides they reduce the thickness of well the dimensions of the transistor reduce and thus we have to reduce the field strength by reducing the voltage we also have to talk to other chips <laughs> because our chip is never well quite often not alone quite often there are other chips on the PCB and the IO voltage that has not scaled down that fast because we can make thick oxide transistors in pretty much any technology they will be bigger they will be not as fast 
but still good enough for sort of input output type of applications. So for example, for Skyware 130, there's a three volt type of device, or maybe it's a five volt type of device also, where we can use that thick oxide transistors in order to interface with the real world. And that IO voltage is today, usually it's three volts, sometimes it's actually 1.8 volts, and well, maybe some memory devices go down as low as 1.2 volts. So in a chip then, we need multiple voltages. We can't only have the battery voltage because our transistors will die. We can't talk to anybody <laughs> at the battery voltage. And we kind of need to keep the voltage stable also. So if we look in a typical sort of integrated circuits, large complex system, maybe we have a USB connection that is at five volts. We might have a lithium ion battery which is somewhere between 2.5 and 4.3 volts, we might have an IO voltage, something where we are gonna talk to other people, other chips. And we might have a core voltage where all the digital runs. Now, between all these, we call them rails, there has to be some form of regulator, some form of circuit that can control the voltage on that rail almost independent of the current that is pulled on that rail. And current is sort of the tricky part here, because if we look at the sort of blocks that we need, if we're talking on an IO, well, that depends on the frequency on, on the digital IOs that we're communicating on, but it might be 50 milliamps or it might be nothing. If we have our bias circuits, our band gap, for example, that probably wants 1.8 volt and that might be off or it may be on. <laughs> and if it's on, it's maybe 100 microamps. Now, if we're looking at sort of the core where we want to pull maybe the most current, it depends very much on what type of chip we have, whether it has a processor, a ADC or a radio or those type of systems. So the regulators that we have to make quite often has to cover a very wide range of currents and we want the voltage to be as stable as we want. Quite often it's enough with maybe plus minus 5%, plus minus 10% is usually what the foundry sets as sort of the min max. But for some things like charging a battery, especially if it's a lithium ion battery, we have to be extremely precise because it turns out when we charge a lithium ion battery, usually you start with sort of a trickle charge if the voltage is really low once the voltage is above maybe three volts, you start with a fast charge where you charge with roughly the capacity of the battery. So if it's a 205 milliamp hour battery, you'll charge with a few hundred milliamps with a constant current. Now, once you hit about 80% or close to that, you'll transition into a constant voltage type of charge. So where you keep the voltage at a very precise voltage, maybe it's 4.3 volt. And that voltage is extremely important to keep within a plus minus of 1%. If you don't do that, if you go too high, you might actually get crystal growth inside a battery, which may short the two terminals together and the thing blows up and everybody's unhappy. Now, once the charge is getting close to completion, the current that will go into the battery will decrease and you can turn it off. So there's sort of multiple challenges here where you have to control the voltage and you have to control, well, as efficient, efficiently as possible, the power delivery system from a battery to the circuit that you're using. And we're gonna go through a few ways of making these regulators, but all of them leveraged negative feedback. So it's some sort of control loop where we measure what the output voltage is, we compare it to a reference, usually a band gap reference, and then we adjust something. So the dynamic range, as I said, might be huge because when a circuit is off, which is most of the time these days, if you're looking at the thing on my hand or your Bluetooth stuff, <laughs> it's not doing anything most of the time which means when you're not doing anything, we should consume nothing <laughs> to make the battery last as long as possible. So maybe the best circuit that you can find today has a uh, sort of sleep currents on the order of tens of nanoamps. That's, that's pretty hard. 
especially in modern modern technologies. But when you're actually doing something, charging the battery, you might have 500 milliamps or even higher. And transmitting on a radio, it might be a few hundred milliamps, depending on the radio standard. Now, it's often not easy to make one regulator to cover the full range of power. Sometimes you have to make multiple, which means that power management systems are actually quite complex. If you look inside a typical chip, this is the... Uh, NREF 5340 and the picture that you're looking at now is copied directly from the product specification it's linked in in the notes you will see that we have multiple supplies you have VBUS, VDD, and uh, VDH and VDD and for the different supplies there are sort of a high voltage regulator there's radio regulator there's main voltage regulator and there's a complex state machine in order to control this because it depends on what happens in the system But what type of regulators are there? That's what I kind of want to focus on most today. The easiest or the most common versions are what we call linear regulators. They look something like this. They have a POSFET. In this case, it's what's called a PMOS. And the POSFET goes between the supply rail, where we get the power from, and our output rail, our 0 0.8 volts the load on the regulator that will be well whatever the system needs and if it's a digital load it'll change quite rapidly <laughs> and every clock cycle you might have a huge spike in current and if it's analog it might be quite constant in this system we are using feedback in order to control the voltage so we are comparing the output voltage to a reference voltage. In this case, we divide down the 1.2 volt that we get from the band gap to whatever we need for the output voltage. And these kind of regulation loops, well, they need to be stable. And one of the key challenges in linear regulators is if you have a very high dynamic range for, in terms of current from nanoamps to hundreds of milliamps, making it stable over that full range of current is actually tricky because quite often in order to handle digital loads, maybe we have an external capacitor, a large capacitor that we connect between the output and ground, and that capacitor delivers most of the current. But if we look at the output pole that is composed of the RDS of our transistor and the capacitor, in addition to the parallel connection of the load, when there is no current flowing in the load, then we don't have much current flowing in the PMOS and our output impedance of the PMOS is high. So the pole at our output is quite low in frequency, high output resistance and a high capacitance. As we increase the current, the effective resistance that we see at the output actually decreases. So when we get up to 500 milliamps or something like that, we're talking, what is that, half an ohm? Yeah, half an ohm times the capacitance, suddenly our really low frequency pole turns into a high frequency pole. And now the question is, is it still stable? Is it now the dominant pole if we have the large capacitor at the output? And these type concerns are sort of the tricky parts of what we call these uh, LDO or low dropout regulator designs. Another challenge is that if you're gonna have really high currents, the PMOS will become quite big because the hold mobility is not that fast or <laughs> large. An alternative is actually to use an NMOS pulse fat. But before we get there, let's have a look at a different type of um, features or parameters, key things. Because in this regulator, there are a few things that we care about. For example, when we change the load, so let's uh, say we apply a load step from zero milliamps up to 500 milliamps. We really want the output voltage to stay constant. But does that load step change anything? Is our loop gain the same at low current at a high current? Probably not exactly because the output impedance 
of the PMOS is different. But maybe it is. <laughs> For line regulation, as we change our VDD from 1.5 to, let's say it's actually directly connected to battery, so up to 3.6 volts, then we don't want our output voltage to change. But maybe it does, because maybe the op-amp changes gain as a function of VDD voltage. One really important thing is that m a lot of the times where we need regulators is to sort of reject noise on the supply, because on a battery supply where the, there is a high internal resistance in the battery, the voltage ripple can actually be quite large, tens of millivolts. There are sensitive circuits that we'll look in later in the course, like uh, phase lock loops, where we really need the supply to be very constant. And something that is important then is what we call power, power supply rejection ratio. So how much, what's the transfer function basically from the VDD down to our output? And of course, how much current can we deliver? And the question current, so how much current does the LDO consume by itself when you're not delivering any current? Because something that should be obvious is that in order to control the gate voltage of the PMOS, we have to use some current in the op-amp and the divider at the input. And it sort of also should make sense that the speed of the op-amp will also de determine how fast we can react to, to a load step in current. So maybe we actually have to use quite a bit of current in the op-amp. Here is actually quite common to, to have sort of a feedback system where the current used in the op-amp, so the speed of the op-amp, actually depends on how much current is used in the output PMOS. So this sort of an internal feedback type of structure. And of course, how, how long does it take to settle? It would be really bad if we have a huge load current step of, uh, let's say 500 milliamps, and we need the voltage to be stable, but it takes a second <laughs> to reach that level. That would be bad, so our, our circuit would die and brown out for way before we actually get to the point where uh, it's useful. So, I mentioned earlier that it's possible to use an NMOS POSFET. NMOS has the advantage that the electromobility is about three times higher than the PMOS, not the whole mobility, which means that an NMOS can be smaller for the same current. But there is a challenge with the NMOS, and that is that we have to apply a gate voltage that is significantly higher than our output voltage. So in the PMOS version, well, the voltage at the gate can be between zero and VDD, and zero is the where it's, we have the most current available, in the other, in the NMOS version, when we pull the gate to VDD, we still only have a limited overdrive. So that VGS required for the NMOS, that is the challenge with the NMOS uh, POSFET. It is actually possible to add charge pumps, which we'll see later today, so to boost the voltage of the NMOS above the rail. And in that case, the NMOS version is quite good. There is a challenge though, and that is that in the NMOS, what we're actually looking at is a common gate amplifier. So as our digital load goes up and down, that current goes straight through and is kind of amplified to the rail. So NMOS can be better for power supply reduction ratio and control of the voltage, but actually it can be worse for other people on the same supply. While in the PMOS case, most of the voltage ripple is taken out on the, in this case, the digital supply, while you don't get that much change in current on the VDD. When we design LDOs, you start with the output pass fed. And I made a simple test bench that is linked in, in this link. So you can click that and we can go, go to that uh, page. Ooh, slow, slow, slow. There we go. You can find that test bench. It's in the uh, corner analog transistor library. You have to scale that output P, uh, PMOS in this case for the maximum output current. 
in this case I've, I've gone a few iterations to sort of get to the size and it's a thousand times <laughs> 11 micron so it's quite large device the op amp that I'm using is a simple uh, what is this called a non-linear voltage controlled voltage source where the voltage on the gate is given by 1 plus tan h so this gives me sort of a, a tan h type of function uh, which just limits the output voltage to within my rails and then a thousand times gain times the difference between the reference and the output voltage and this makes spice happy so i can get sort of a, a uh, gate voltage that is stable i've added the loaded cap just at the output and then I sweep the load current and then we can see how the gate voltage of the device changes so <clears throat> we can actually get quite a large change in current by changing the gate voltage so we can see here what we're uh, what we have at the um, x-axis is the gate source voltage so for a high gate source voltage well in this case we're actually we have the source at VDD and the gate at lower voltage so I guess it should have been negative for the PMOS but well doesn't matter that much we can sort of see the transition from sub threshold when we have a low gate source voltage into strong inversion where we have a, a slightly different slope notice that this is a log plot so we go from what is this maybe three microamps up to 500 milliamps on the same transistor now sometimes you'll find that it is actually quite tricky to stabilize this loop um, during in the full range and quite often in a integrated circuit you will know when there's a lot of current is going to be used and when there's not a lot of current because it depends on the system state so quite often micro microcontrollers will know when large current steps will come so that means that people have found strategies to sort of simplify the control loop or simplify the system itself. We can either modulate the VGS directly, as I shown before, where we have one big PMOS, or we could actually split it up into multiple PMOSs and then use sort of digital control. So if we know we're going to spend 500 milliamps, maybe we could connect the big transistors. If we know we're only spending, we're only going to consume nanoamps we can disable the big ones and only have a small one because that's more than enough to deliver the load current that we have at that, that point in time it's also possible to do duty cycle control where we turn on and off the PMOS and on average the current in the PMOS will then be equivalent to our load current all of these regula linear regulators have one problem, and that is that the load current we pull is going to be the same current as we get from our supply. If our supply is high, let's assume it's 5 volt directly from USB, and our output is low, 1 volt. Then, if we look at our power consumption at the uh, output voltage, let's say one volt times let's say 100 milliamps so that's 100 milliwatts however at the VDD we are consuming 100 milliamps times 5 which is 500 milliwatts so somewhere that 400 milliwatts has to be <laughs> it has to be dissipated somewhere and it turns out that's actually dissipated in the PMOS and that causes two problems one it's quite inefficient to waste sort of uh, four times of well four you have one fourth uh, one fifth in your output load and you have four fifths in your PMOS just burning at best heat so that's inefficient but also it creates a heat problem so LDOs might actually overheat because you are burning too much power in the output PMOS so in order to fix the problem of efficiency we can go to a type of regulator called switched regulators these are the ones you'll find in every single AC type of uh, system by these sort of things like this uh, 
these will be switch mode converters. So this is sort of an AC to DC converter. But inside on the chip, we have DC to DC converters. I find that people struggle a bit with understanding them. So I will think I'll start quite easy because if we look at the hard stuff from the beginning, it is maybe a bit too complex. So this is one of the papers I've linked in, you can have a look. If we go to I think it was figure four, fire, no, sorry, figure seven. Yeah, here's the one. So here we see the full switch mode converter. Now, if you've never seen a DC DC converter before, I would assume that you're looking at this picture and you're thinking, oh, what's going on here? <laughs> How does it work? This seems very complicated. And it is, but it's not as complicated as you think. So I'm going to try to explain it slightly more simple, but at least get across the key concept. So let's start with what we call buck DC DCs or step down DC DC converters. Now in order to use switch mode, we have to use some sort of storage device. Either it's an inductive storage device where we can store current, or it's a capacitive storage device or a capacitor, where you can store charge. In case of the inductive, we'll have our output voltage, which might be at 0 0.8 volts, and we have our input voltage at 1.8 volts. So the input voltage in this case is higher than the output voltage. And what we want to do is deliver power efficiently to the load. The way this works is that we have a switch where we connect the inductor to our input voltage. In that case, we'll have one volt across the inductor. The inductor, if you remember the equation for the inductor, the voltage across the inductor is given by L times di dt, so the current through the inductor, which means that the inductor will integrate, well, the, the current is an integral of the voltage as the current increases, since we have now a constant voltage, assuming the out doesn't change much, a constant voltage across the inductor, we get a sort of constant increase in current. When I turn off the switch, so open the switch, then the sort of differential equations for the inductor tell us that current cannot change in instantaneously. If current changes instantaneously in the an inductor, then the voltage across the inductor will be infinite. And that's actually what happens when you have sort of really big switches or you're pulling out your plug from your AC outlet and sometimes you get a spark gap. That's actually the inductance. So the inductance creates sort of a, a huge voltage which is sufficient to ionize the air and sort of break down and create a current through the air. That's the spark gap type of thing. In this case, when we open the switch, there is a connection to ground already. And since the current in the inductor cannot change instantaneously, it will actually stay the same. But now we are pulling the current from ground. So in order to pull the current from ground, what actually happens is that the voltage at the left side of the inductor will go negative below ground, about a dia voltage below ground, and then the current will go up to V out. So it goes in the wrong direction or it goes it continues in the same direction. But of course, what happens now is that the voltage across the inductor is sort of um, negative, it's, it's going the other way, which means that the current will reduce until we get to the point where the current in the diode is zero, and then it stops. But in this case, we are for a little bit of time, stealing some current from Vn. But most of the time, we're actually stealing it from ground. And then it sort of should make sense that any current load that we have on the output, we won't get the same current from the input. And we'll see a bit more details later. It is possible to do also a capacitive buck. So go down with capacitors. What we do then is to have two capacitors, in this case of equal size, and we charge the series combination of those capacitors to a high voltage, Vn. And then we reconfigure the circuit with some switches and we get a Vn divided by two because now we're connecting the 
capacitors in parallel. The reason we get Vn divided by 2 is simply because we have two equal capacitors, the charge across them we assume that to be the same, and that the voltage in the midpoint here it becomes a division by 2, so Vn divided by 2, so the voltage across the bottom capacitor is Vn divided by 2, and then the same across the top capacitor, connecting them together, our output voltage now is half. The challenge with the capacitive buck is that in this case we can only get an output voltage that's sort of an integral proportion of our capacitors or our, our input voltage. If we want something slightly different, so for example if we wanted an output voltage that is constant, 0 0.8 volts plus minus 10 percent, and our input voltage changes from 1.8 to whatever, then it becomes a bit more tricky and we actually have to add an LDO after the um, capacitive buck because we can't as we change as we change the input voltage the output voltage will change directly because it's the given by the ratio of capacitors to each other we don't have to go down <laughs> we can we don't have to go down in voltage we can actually go up in voltage with an inductive boost then we just reconfigure the circuit a little bit we have our input voltage Let's say that is at 1.8 volts. Actually, no, let's say it's different. So if we have a, uh, what's it called? Thermoelectric generator. So a solar cell or a, a um, thermoelectric generator, which can generate a voltage as a function of, uh, of the heat across, or the heat difference across the um, the device. It's, it's kind of thing that you can buy with sort of, at least here in Norway, fans that you can put on top of your oven that sort of gets stuck that starts working when the oven is hot <laughs> anyway those type of tags they have a very small voltage across but you can deliver a large current so maybe the input voltage here is 200 millivolts but we need 800 or we may need 1.8 volts for the output if we take that 200 millivolts and we connect our switch to ground now, we set up a current in the inductor, and as we open the switch, the voltage at the left side of the diode will shoot up until we reach a point where the current can be delivered into our load. In this case, we are boosting the output voltage, going from a low input voltage to a high output voltage. We can do the same with capacitors. So in this case, we are using parallel capacitors, charging them to certain input voltage, and then stacking them. And we do this by reconfiguring switches. So all these different type of bucks and boosts are very common inside integrated circuits. <coughs> Sorry. The advantage with the capacitor boosts and capacitor bucks is that you don't need additional external circuits. And you can usually make the capacitors internally large enough in order to deliver the, the voltage that you need. The disadvantage is this integral relation between input voltage and output voltage. For inductive boost and buck, it's very rare to have the inductors on chip. Quite often they're outside their uh, discrete components outside because they need to be at a quite large inductance, maybe a micro Henry or something like that or even larger. Let's look at a bit more details, because I find that people do get confused <laughs> when we talk about inductive DC-DCs. So, we have our buck again. Now I've replaced the switches with transistors. So we have the switch that we saw before, it was replaced by a PMOS, and the diode is replaced by an NMOS, because what we really need from the diode in the previous picture is to only conduct when we are pulling current from ground. <laughs> and we can do that with an NMOS instead. And the, the thing with the NMOS uh, that is better is that we can have a lower voltage across the NMOS than we can across the diode, because the diode's always going to give, let's say, maybe 5, 0 0.5 to 0 0.7 volts across it. So it's a similar situation. We connect our... A not or sorry, uh, A bar, and turn on the PMOS, connecting VDDH to V1. And if we look at the equations for what happens, we can see that the current in the inductor, 
that is the integral of the voltage difference across the inductor. And then the output voltage, that is the integral of the current. So capacitors integrate current. So it will be the integral of the uh, current in the inductor minus the integral of the current in the load. Now these are sort of, I don't know if it's called coupled differential equations, but you can see that they depend on each other because the current depend on the voltage across. The voltage across depend on the current. In addition, the controls for A0 and B, those are discrete time. So this is not a linear system. So don't confuse this sort of structure that you see here with a low pass filter or don't try to use Laplace to figure out what's going on. You kind of have to look at the dif differential equations and you have to do some sort of um, numerical solution to the problem. One way to get an idea of what's going on is actually to do the numerical integration. So what I've done is I've created a Jupyter notebook where I used the equations I saw, uh, showed you on a previous page in order to compute what happens in the DCDC converter. In this case, um, I'm going to show you something called pulse width modulation first, and then later we'll look at a slightly different way of controlling the loop. But <clears throat> it turns out that if we look at our A signal, so this is when we turn on our PMOS, we can see that the output current, the IX, sorry, not the output current, the current in the inductor, that increases. Right now we have a high voltage across the inductor, so the uh, current increases fast. And then we turn it off. Now, the output voltage is, in this case, very low. So we can see the output voltage uh, in the second plot here. So that is increasing. But during the second cycle, part of the cycle, the output voltage doesn't decrease that much. And then we pump another cycle and so on. If we look at what happens during the complete sort of uh, settling behavior, we'll first see that when, when we start from zero, there will be an overshooting current, so that's the IX, and then we'll settle around to a final current. And we can still see that it ripples back and forth. And the voltage in this case, it settles to one volt. I'll, I'll go into details on the Jupiter model in just a second. But I wanted to show you what happens when we're completely settled. In this case, the, I think in this case, I have a pretty low output current. So a load current. Uh, what's this? It's probably, is that 10 milliamps? Yeah, it's probably 10 milliamps. What we can see is that the output voltage is very close to one volt, and that's actually where I intended to set it. The input voltage in this uh, plot, I think, is four volts. And the cool thing about PVM control or pulse width modulation control of this type of DC-DC loop is when I turn on the PMOS, that's when I pull current from our VDD. When the PMOS is turned off, then I do not pull current from VDD, I pull it from ground. And we can see that the voltage is sort of following some sort of, it's integrating this current in sort of a, a second order type of equation, since it's a linear ramp. But the average current that I get is equal to IO. So the average current uh, in the blue here is equal to our load current. But the current pull from VDD is only the part that is during the high cycle here. So in the DC-DC converter, we're actually pulling less current from our VDD then we are delivering to our load. And that's sort of the key concept of DC-DC converters. Let me jump to the um, Jupyter model and let's have a look at that. So <clears throat> this is the Jupyter model. Uh, maybe it's a bit small. Let's try, let's try and make it bigger. Let's see, okay. So it has um, a few parameters. So we have 
uh, well, that's just uh, what one micro is. We have the inductor, one micro Henry. I've added a series resistance in the switches, and that's just to make the numerical integration a bit easier. There's a one micro capacitor. There is a 100 ohm load resistor. So that means at one volt, our, uh, up, well, then our current's going to be 10 milliamps. We have how fast it's running. So it's, it's running at 0 0.1 microsecond um, for each period. And then we have the duty cycle. And the cool thing about the duty cycle is that actually controls our output voltage. So uh, let's see, mode, let's have a look at the plot here. Okay, so this is the settled plot. So if I choose mode equals settled and run it, no thanks, no survey. <laughs> and let's see. So here we're running at one volt output. If I now change it to be a, let's say 0 0.1 duty cycle and run again. Oh, my son just started playing piano upstairs. Hopefully you can't hear that. <laughs> but, oh, right. Uh, I should remove that settling thing because that sets the ILM. Okay, so now you can see the output voltage is 0 0.4 because now we're multiplying by duty cycle of 0 0.1. So the cool thing about these sort of PVM controlled DCDCs is that by adjusting the duty cycle of the PVM, we can control the output voltage. So if I were to create a feedback loop for my PVM controlled DC DC, all I need to control is the duty cycle of how much do I turn on A and how much do I turn on B. And in that case, whenever VDDH changes, then the output voltage doesn't change because my control loop adjusts the duty cycle and everything's fine. Okay. So I encourage you to play a bit with the um, DC DC Jupiter models. There's a second type of control loop that is quite often used because imagine that I'm actually not using that much current. Let's go to the model and set the current to something really high. And let's do that and then rerun. Let's see. Yeah, I want to set the do cycle to... That's fine. Okay. In this case, I don't have any load and my current will integrate to zero in the inductor. But I'm still switching my PMOS and NMOS. And those PMOS and NMOS can be quite large. And I'm sort of wasting energy in the switching of those capacitances. So in a PVM type of mode, it's it's pretty good for high currents, but for really low currents, it is not ideal. What we want in low currents is actually kind of a discontinuous mode where we, we do not switch <laughs> if we don't have to. So it's quite common for DC-DC converters to have these sort of multiple different operating modes. And that's what I want to look at next. So. Oh, maybe <laughs> an example first. So if you look at the NRF 5340, you will actually see in the hardware description that there are three inductors of 10 microhenry and capacitors, similar to the structure that I showed you before. And it's natural then to assume that there is actually three DC-DCs inside here. So in order to really get high power efficiency, you need DC-DC converters. And quite often it's the inductive ones that we want to use. I wanted to touch on last today, a slightly different way of controlling the loop. We are doing actually the same thing. So we're turning on our PMOS, setting up the inductor and the, um, setting up the current in the inductor and 
turning on the animals to steal some current from the ground. The challenge is that we don't want to do that continuously like in the PVM control. We only want to do that when necessary. And what I can do is turn on the PMOS for a short time, which sets up the current. And then I turn on the NMOS. And then I detect using the zero cross comparator, because as soon as I turn on the NMOS, the voltage at DCC here will shoot below ground because the current is going from our, well, from the left side of the inductor to the right side. So the DCC must be below ground in order for there to flow current from ground down to DCC. But when there's zero current flowing in the inductor, then the voltage across DCC and ground will be zero. So I can just measure the voltage across my, my NMOS and detect when there is zero current and then turn off the NMOS. That's sort of one cycle. And then I can do it again if my output voltage drops to low. So I've also implemented this in a Jupyter model. What you're looking at now is the state diagram. So we go from sort of an idle state when we're not doing anything, doing anything. When the VOL comparator, that's the, the output voltage is too low, triggers, then we turn on the PMOS and just leave it on for a fixed amount of time, just counting up. When we have elapsed that timer, we turn on the NMOS and we wait until the, the serial cost comparator triggers and then we're back to idle. The cool thing about this sort of discontinuous mode is that what we'll get is these kind of current pulses. So what you're looking at here now is the voltage will decrease as a function of time or as a function of load. Whenever we get to the point where we trigger the charge cycle, the current in the inductor will increase and after a certain time, we turn off the PMOS and we turn on the NMOS and then the current decreases again back to zero. And then here we actually get some numerical oscillations. That's not the uh, important part. Now the cool thing about these um, discontinuous mode or pulse frequency mode is we're only switching when necessary which means that we, we limit the amount of loss in loss due to the switching on the PMOS and NMOS capacitances. Let's see if we can actually get the simulation to run here. Yeah, here we go. So maybe let's try and uh, zoom in a bit. So if I zoom in to 105, Run that. Then we can see in more detail what happens. As we turn on the PMOS, so that's this up state, then the current in the inductor increases. And here we can see the voltage at the output. That sort of follow, follows an integral of the current. Now, as we reach the top, then the DVDT will reach its maximum. And now we're turning on the NMOS. And then the current will integrate down again. And we turn off the NMOS and then, well, this stuff is just some numerical oscillations due to how the uh, integration is implemented in the Python model. The cool thing about these um, DC-DC converters it, is that they can become very efficient. So even down to very low loads, you can get efficiency, power efficiency of more than 90%. And that means we use our electrons much more efficient, efficiently. Maybe one thing I want to hi highlight if you start looking into these um, Jupyter models is let's look at the equations. So this is the PVM control. We have a definition of time. And then we have the equations for the... Um, voltage across our inductor, which is simply is the PMOS on times VDDH minus uh, some drop, or, <laughs> sorry, minus some drop due to the uh, resistance in the switch. The, I've added this just to make sure that I don't get some ringing. <laughs> uh, and then I have minus the output voltage, the previous output voltage. The current is the previous current plus one over L 
times the voltage difference divided by the time. But here I'm actually using what's called a trapezoidal approximation of the area under the curve, because what I'm actually doing is integrating an area under, under a curve. I don't know who figured this out, but it turns out that if you combine the combine voltages from two different points in time, and you figure out sort of the triangle, <laughs> the trapezoid, uh, then you get a better estimate of the average value at a, any given point in time. I think this is very, quite similar to what's done in SPICE when they do numer numerical integration, and you'll see this sometimes on the currents um, in SPICE that they sort of have this triangular shape. And that's due to the integration method. There are other ways of solving these equations, but I've just done, thing, done something very simple here. Okay, I think that's pretty much what I co uh, co wanted to cover today. Hopefully the background music of piano is not disturbing right now. <laughs> Maybe you can't hear it and you don't know what I'm talking about. Anyway, have a fantastic day.